<clears throat> Clear my throat, ready to go. Whether you're fly fishing in a stream, getting those ankles wet, or deep in the ocean casting nets, fish nerds, fish nerds, fish nerds, it's a podcast. It's a podcast. It's a podcast. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the Fish Nerds, the show about fish, fishing, and eating fish. I'm Clay Groves, Chief Executive Fish Nerd, Licensed Fishing Guide, and your best friend. Tonight in the co-host seat is one of the Fish Nerds correspondents who almost never comes on the show, <laughs> Andrew Lewin, from the Speak Up for the Blue, Speak Up for the Ocean Blue podcast. He's from Canada, and he's our friend. Hi, Andrew. Hey, Clay. How's it going? I'm glad to be back. Thank you for having me back. Yeah, it's, it's really good to see you. We're going to talk about what you want to talk about in a minute, but first, let me give a rundown of the show tonight. Absolutely. Andrew's brought a story tonight he wants to talk about, uh, but we're also going to talk to Dr. Richie um, about Arapaima fish scales and how they're the strong, one of the strongest substances in the world. Doc Martin is bringing us that interview. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, Napod Pomo, National Podcast Posting Month, coming up here in November, where every day... Uh, we're supposed to post a brand new show. <laughs> we're going to do fish in the news. And of course, Andrew is with us. Um, so Andrew, are you doing anything for national podcast posting month? You know, you always inspire me to do something for this month. Cause I, I saw yeah. you do, especially last year you did what you posted a show every day, right? Every day I did a fish in the news every single day last year. And that was amazing. So how long were those shows last year? Some of them were four minutes long. Some were 20 minutes long. Yeah. It all really depends on my mood. Right. Uh, this year, we're going to do something very different. Uh, and this is inspired by my, my kids have a podcast called The Daily Chicken, where every day they tell a chicken joke to chickens, um, which you heard in the pre-show. <laughs> uh, and it's terrible and funny all at the same time. But All is, is awesome. The, the plan is to do The Daily Fish Nerds, where every single day we will tell fish jokes uh, on there. And we're going to encourage listeners to get involved and other podcasters to get involved. So if you want to send in a fishy joke to us, you can either push record on your cell phone and just talk into your phone and give us the recording, or you can and the email that to clay at fishnerds.com, or you can call the Fish Nerds hotline, which is 607-378-FISH. Leave us a voicemail and we'll use that on the thing. Really important, you can do off-color jokes. You can do a joke, not, don't do racist jokes, but do um, you could do dark humor you can do adult themed jokes just let us know up front that's what they are so when i mix them in i can warn uh, anyone else that that might be coming up on us um we, we'd ask that you keep racist jokes to yourself we don't need that here on the i think i think podcast. i think that's a good idea dad jokes are probably the best jokes. kind of jokes when you dad, dad jokes, jokes. Are, are the best kind i expect to see a lot of jokes that are like uh um let's see uh, uh what do you call a fish with no eyes with no what sorry what do you call a fish with no eyes? I don't know. <laughs> so I expect to see a lot of jokes yes, like that. Yes. <laughs> I love but it. But you can go big. You can tell stories that lead to a joke. Yeah, we don't care. Right. No rules. Call them in. We'll take more than 30 because we can do two, three day if, if we get a lot of them. Love uh, it. Or if they're really short. Yeah. Uh, so call them in 607-378-FISH and you can be part of it. We'll still keep the regular show coming out, but we'll do one of those every day. And I have last year's Fish in the News in the archive. They're not available on the regular Fish Nerds feed. And I'm going to put those up on our Patreon.com. Nice. Uh, so people who want to get copies yes. of that can go to Patreon.com slash Fish Nerds and can check all that out and listen to that, that show. And I'll mix them all to one long episode of Fish in the News. I love that. I'll take out all the intros and stuff that make it awful to listen to. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll tell you, you know what I love about your idea about the, the fish jokes is I love hearing from the audience. That is Anytime my, I've done a couple people. of episodes. Oh, it's so much fun though. I get such a rush out of it. Cause I just tell them I'm like, just do it on your phone, right? Just record on your phone, send it in. And, and they were sending it to me through Facebook messenger. They were sending it through email. They were sending it through any like Instagram. It didn't matter as long as I could download it or use it or record it somehow. I was able to get them on and it made me feel so good to have people on from the audience. Yeah. I mean, it is hard when it comes in six different places and you forget. Oh, for sure. Things. No doubt. It gets to be a mess, but yeah. Yeah. It's a little bit extra work on our side, but it's so worth it. So worth well, it. Any, any time a call, because, because most of the time, Andrew, as you know, when you make a podcast, I work on the radio during my regular job now too. You're talking into a box yeah. and you're just hoping you're reaching somebody. It's so so any feedback is good feedback. Yeah. 
we'll take it anytime we can get it. Absolutely. So you brought a story with you tonight. Is this news or just a story you want to talk about? Well, it's, it's, I mean, it's news. It's from, it's from Manga Bay, right? Oh, well, then if it's news, I got to hit the orange button. Hit the orange button. I love it. I love it. I mean, it's, it's from like, it's from Manga Bay. We've covered Manga Bay on here before I've covered it on my podcast. Our friend, our friend Eric. Uh, runs yeah. That. Yeah. Love it. Uh, it's, it's actually one of my favorite news sites just to read in general. I always learn the problem with Manga Bay is it's too good. <laughs> it's too good. Like I, I had a story for tonight from Manga Bay and it had so many details. Right. That I was reading it. I'm like, that's oh, too much. I can't do it. Well, I can't. <laughs> what I love about it, it's, it's, it's original content. Like a lot of yep. the, the media sites, when you look at stuff, it's the same stuff just on different sites, just gets picked up. This is actually like, they have their own um, journalists who go like, sometimes they go deep and dark to to get this story that they need uh, and they write great articles. And they're just, they're for an environmentalist like myself or anybody who's interested in science or environment, like the real environment, that's what, you know, what we see here. So um, I love this one. And, and to be honest, it's, it's, it's stemming from Manga Bay, but really it, it goes to a lot of different stories that I've read over the past few months. And it's really has to do with, with China. And I, I have to admit, I'm getting impressed by the Chinese government putting out policies, putting out, um, you know, getting involved in different aspects of uh, fisheries and all this kind of stuff, and they're trying to do better. And uh, in fact, there's a new there's a new story out that I was just talking about on my podcast. I just record for my podcast where they are in the midst of a huge, huge vote for Antarctic marine protected areas, and this has to do with like. You know, Antarctica is managed by 24, 25 different countries, including like the U.S., Canada, the U.K., Russia, China. You know, these are countries that are always at odds. And then all of a sudden, they're working together for peace. They're working together for environment. They're working together to save that environment. They, they came together about five or six years ago to dedicate the Ross Sea Marine Protected Area and then, uh, which was a huge thing, it had been in play for like over 10 years, a number of votes that went to seeing it protected. China, Russia would always vote against it. And all of a sudden they were like, no, we're going to go for it. And now Russia's on board and China is just really the, the only country that needs to, that they don't know where they're going to vote. And so I think there was a New York Times article that was penned by John Kerry, who we know very big in U.S. politics, was the U.S. Secretary of State uh, until 2017. And he is a huge advocate for oceans, especially on that international political level. And so I have a lot of respect for him. And, and, and he just has a lot of, I think, he, I feel like this article just that he wrote shows that he has a lot of confidence in the way the Chinese are going to vote this time. And there's about three marine protected areas that are being voted on, on the Eastern coast of, um, of Antarctica that will protect it's, it's the, they're protecting the fisheries, not only protecting like the Antarctic toothfish, but they're going to protect krill um, krill. There's, there's an estimated like 23 million. Uh, no, what is it? The, hold on. I got to find the, the actual number here. Cause this, this blew my mind um, with the amount of carbon it's here. It is. It says uh, krill is a food source uh, for that ecosystem and through its life cycle also helps lock up 23 million tons of carbon dioxide annually from the earth's atmosphere. That's equivalent uh, to greenhouse gases produced annually for by 35 million cars. Now isn't krill like a little shrimp? Yeah, it's a tiny little shrimp. And how does it lock up the carbon dioxide? Well, it's basically, I mean, it, it basically takes in like, so, so it, through, it's a great question that, that really threw me off, obviously. <laughs> um, uh, but, but through sort of like, it's, it's the way it, it, it develops, the way its life cycle is, it basically 
locks like the way it develops it has carbon dioxide it builds it through its shell it and then all of a sudden it will lock up this this carbon dioxide and then it'll bring it down to the bottom um and then it'll it'll keep it down to the bottom also it eats phytoplankton that bring in carbon dioxide through respiration we know phytoplankton is evil so it has to eat them <laughs> Why is it evil? <laughs> uh, well, if we we're, we have to pick a team. We, we got to pick a team. That's right. We got to go for Krill. Krill's got to take Fido Plank. Um, yeah, screw those bastards. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Uh, so anyway, so yeah, so it, so it essentially it it does lock them up and and um, you know and and through that it just helps cycle through. It, it helps with the the natural carbon cycle um, and and it just produces so much benefit to have these these uh, small, tiny little organisms in play uh, in the Antarctic. Um, you know, if we didn't have them, we we'd be up up creek without a paddle you know, literally, you know, it would be, we would have a lot of water that would not be uh, welcomed along our shores, you know, with the amount of, course, of yeah. ice melting in Antarctica that we're already seeing, imagine what that would be without krill that could, um, that wouldn't be able to lock up that many, that much carbon dioxide. Right now, are krill in any kind of danger? Are they doing okay? They're doing okay. What they're worried about with krill is, um, Throwing off the 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 amount of fish that's in the system destabilizes the system. We don't know what's going to happen with krill. It could easily fall. Climate change as well, with warming waters, shifting, um, you know, upwellings, sh- shifting uh, currents. It could it could basically affect the way the the krill reproduce. It could affect the way the krill build their shells. You know, when you look at ocean acidification, their shells are you know, carbonate type of, of shell. And so without that carbon dioxide in the water, without, with too much carbon dioxide, um, you, you get this, you, you can't calcify. There's no calcium to take up. It becomes free calcium and you can't take it. You can't get the free calcium up. So um, it becomes a real problem. Uh, the krill just disappears because it can't build shells. And then eventually you don't get any, you don't get any krill or you get a reduced amount and then you don't get as, you know, it's just a negative feedback system, right? Where krill can't take up the carbon dioxide, uh, you know, cause they can't have, they can't form their shell. They can't live. And then you just get just, uh, just disaster eventually. It's game, game over. Game over big time. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, but I, I feel like it just seems like when you have articles like this, you know, they're basically trying to put pressure on a country to, to vote in a good way by showing how much benefit it could have. And also with, with a lot of, you know, the way China has been going, I think last time I was on the episode uh, on the show, I talked about, you know, sort of China policies and, and their distant fleet of what they were doing. Uh, And I feel like with all the negativity that surrounds Chinese fishing vessels, um, these new policies, this ability to affect the vote again here in a positive way can really show that, you know, a, a large country, a country of 3 billion people can really change and turn the tide uh, for conservation just by making these, these decisions in a very quick time. Like if you think about it, within a year, they've done all this kind of stuff. Well, it, it's almost funny. It's funny because you hear that. And then on the other hand, like, like even this is from Manga Bay as well, is China's dark vessel is poaching the Galapagos waters. Like they are taking fish like crazy in other parts, you know, so they do some positive stuff and then they're like, oh, we're still going to take all these fish over here, you know? Well, and Yeah. And, and this is where it's, it's, it's difficult. And, and this is where the enforcement for that distant. So, so according to their policies that they've enacted in April, that they implemented in April, this is not accepted anymore in China. So if these Chinese vessels went back to China, and they were discovered. The captain would lose his license for three years. The the company manager would lose his, his, their, his or her job for three years, which is a huge effect rather than just paying a fine that they can afford and turn around and go out and fish again. So the key here is, can it be enforced by China? And will it be enforced well, by China? That's so the key. so here's, how they, here's how China enforces it. They have GPS on all their boats and they track them to see where they're doing their fishing around the world. Uh, now, according to Manga Bay, this is another story. This is another article entirely. Uh, there's a fleet of Chinese-owned fishing vessels fishing down in the Galapagos right now who turned off their GPS yeah. 
so that when they get back, nobody will know where they caught their fish from. Right. But, uh, but international, um, uh, I forget the company who's doing it, but people are tracking them using radio signals, yes. not GPS. So they're able now to say, yeah, you were down the Galapagos and you were fishing illegal waters. Yeah. And they're starting to bust them for it, which is good. Well, and I, I, I also think too, if you turn off your GPS, you should be charged right away. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like it's, 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 uh, and, and there have been times where GPS has really worked out for fishing fleets, uh, in the great barrier reef, uh, back in early two thousands, I remember seeing a presentation, uh, from a manager at the great barrier reef Marine park where they increased their no take areas by 30%. It was at 3% and they increased it to 33% based on GPS data from their fishers. Uh, and what they noticed is the areas that they wanted to increase the fishermen weren't fishing. So when they went to them and they said, this is the area that we want to increase, fishermen were like, yeah, great. We don't go there anyway for fishing. Yeah. And they ended up being important <laughs> nursery areas that are going to benefit them in the future. So it ended up, I mean, in that case, it ended up working out, but they saw where the fishers were going. So they said, if we go in with this proposal, it's going to be easy. We're not reducing their fishing by any, by like their, their catch per unit effort by any means. You know, we're just, all we're doing is, increasing the level of protection where they don't fish. So it actually ends up being a benefit. What the cool thing about GPS is, is that you can tell when a boat slows down to trawl. That's the, that's the okay. wonders. Like, cause they, you just see the the rate just like move a lot slower. And I, I'll never forget. I was part of this, this study where it was like a, I was at a consultant, an environmental consulting firm where one of those guys had like 30 years of data. And what he did is he programmed it to like, all the boat, boats were points, but every time they fished, he made the, the, the color on the point turn red. And so for 30 years, you can see how it would turn blue and turn red. And that when they were trawling, when basically when the speed slowed down to a trawling speed, this was in the Gulf of Mexico, they would be able to tell when and how long they would, they would fish for, where they would trawl for. It was, it was like the, the amount of stuff you can do with satellite data and GPS data is just ridiculous right now. It's amazing. Yeah, I should, I should say, though, um, just to be clear, the data that they have for these fishing uh, down in the Galapagos is inconclusive evidence. Right. I can't prove for sure they were there, but it looks really, <laughs> it looks like they were there. I mean, I'm looking at the tracking. <laughs> it's it's yeah. pretty much, they've got a good circle around the exclusive economic zone <laughs> boundary, and, and you can just see all their tracks. So, uh, yeah. yeah, they're definitely, and I mean... <laughs> There was an article, I think it was by Mongo Bay too, that had like, it was like 200 vessels that were on the border. Like those are pictures of these Chinese vessels on the border. Yeah. This article I'm looking at now is there's 300. Yeah. Three, yeah. <laughs> 300. But there's a lot of people in China they have to eat and they are a big fish eating culture. They are. Uh, and, and so that's, that's the game. It's yeah. huge people. <laughs> it's, it's hard yeah. out there. If, if people aren't already looking at Manga Bay on a regular basis, they're missing out on a great uh, resource for news. Highly recommend it. Yeah. And we're not even it's sponsored by them. We just love them. No, but I've had Eric on the show a number of times. Yes. Uh, have you had him on your show? Uh, n- <sighs> That's a good question. I if feel, you haven't, for shame. I feel like he's been on at least once. At yeah. least once. Yeah, yeah uh, he was interviewed. He's a great guy. And Manga Bay has a podcast, too, that you can check yes. out. Yes, yeah. You want to get some serious fish news, that Manga Bay is a lot more serious than us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I've actually, I've actually had one of their journalists on as well. I think Eric hooked me up with one of the journalists. Yeah, he's always emailing me, and I'm always like, I'll, I'll get back to you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, anything else about stuff, that story? Good stuff. Yeah. No, I'm just like, I, like I said, I'm super impressed at, at just the direction that this country's going. It's a country that we don't get to hear about often. So it always, uh, it always makes me, makes me interested in that, in that kind of stuff. It is. And people don't, I think, I think, you know, getting in North America, you, you get complacent. You don't realize how big a country that country is and how important it is in the world. I mean, right. It's huge. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's very easy to, very easy to get complacent, especially, I think, especially Americans because we're so self-centered. It's hard to, <laughs> hard to think too. other countries. What do you the mean Canadians. other countries? You know, what's funny is oftentimes in Canada, we actually are more <laughs> apt to uh, critique other countries, especially the U.S. Mm-hmm. But then we when we look it. at our own country, we're like, 
what are we doing? And we're like, oh no, we're perfect. We're not perfect by any means. And it's time that we start looking at that. Uh, I do have another story to bring if, if, if that's all right. Oh, please. Yeah, I got, I got a couple too, but just bring it. Well, this one's been, in, I, I mean, this one's been in the news in Canada for, for quite some time now, for, for about, probably for the last month. Um, it has to do with Indigenous people in Nova Scotia, uh, the, the Mi'kmaq Indigenous people. Uh, and it's, it's kind of blown up into a huge um, Indigenous issue not only in Nova Scotia, but here in Ontario, because uh, the Mi'kmaq have tribes along, along, all along Canada. And so now well, they also been, came down to New England too. They yes. were exclusively Canada. They didn't know Canada. It wasn't a thing. No, Canada wasn't a thing. There was no border <laughs> at that point. Right. Uh, they weren't like, I'm Mi'kmaq. Hey, eh? I'm not going across the border. They have me some bacon up here. And <laughs> some maple syrup and everything. Um, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, what was interesting, so all this, this all happened, this all kind of, kind of blew up really when um, it goes, it, it, basically Mi'kmaq, uh, the Mi'kmaq, one indigenous uh, area decided to fish, all of a sudden fish mm-hmm. for lobster. And everybody kind of came out and said, well, hold on a second. You just can't come out and fish. And, and right. a lot of non-indigenous commercial fishers were like, where is this coming from? And it happened that 20 years ago, there was a decision over 20 years ago, 1999, there was a decision in the Supreme Court that basically upheld the right for indigenous fishers to fish for lobster and crab all year long. In, in Canada, the, the commercial fishermen, the non-indigenous commercial fishermen have to go through seasons. And so they had to fish all year long. They got to fish all year long. And so it was upheld in the Canada Supreme Court. And then there was a, an, um, what do you call it? An amendment to that ruling where it said Canada, the government of Canada can approach, like the federal government can approach the uh, indigenous group that it's, that's actually fishing to work with them on conservation issues if they felt that it was required. And, and it had to be agreed by the indigenous people. So basically Canada had no say, and it goes back to like the 1700s when the initial treaty with the indigenous people actually happened. So this all happens. The Mi'kmaq people were like, we're going fishing. And they had a certain number of traps. I think it was 50 traps per boat. Me on that. But overall it was like 500 traps. Um, and if you think about it, in all of Atlantic Canada, there are 900,000 traps. That's so a lot of traps. it's a lot of traps. Now that's including the U.S., right? But that's a lot of traps. Um, but 500 is not really going to contribute, you know, to the detriment of lobster when you no, compare it to 900,000. Like no, well, I mean, I don't know the biomass of lobster. I couldn't tell you how many are out there. But Right now, it, I mean, lobster is like doing pretty well. Let's just say we're not... I mean, it's obviously always a concern about their their reproduction rates and, and how it's going. But so far, not like all the studies that have come out have said they're doing pretty well um, in the they're area. Well, that, and lobster and lobster prices crashed this uh, summer yes. during COVID nineteen. Yes. They couldn't give away lobsters. No, like our no. local fairgrounds were like selling them for like three ninety nine a pound. Oh. <laughs> so, it, which it is like free back lobster. when I when I lived in Halifax, we used to buy it for like six ninety nine a pound. Right from the fishery. That, oh, that's Canadian. Canadian. So that's like yeah. three nine nine a pound, basically. Almost three nine nine yeah. a pound. I mean our, our our local supermarket has it for five for like five nine nine a pound right now. Yeah. Still a great price. Which is a fantastic. Here in Ontario, we pay like fifteen or sixteen nine nine a pound. That's because you're you're thousands of miles from the it's ocean. <laughs> but we can order it right from the airport and they'll they'll bring it to us. You know, it's it's amazing, but you still pay a lot. Um, which is understandable. But well, you pay uh, extra for a seasick lo- for uh, for air for air lobsters. lobsters, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, but w- so essentially, what happened though was, I mean, the government didn't say anything. They said, "Yeah, you you have the right to go fish. You can go. You can go fish." Um, the non-indigenous commercial fishermen had other things to say about it, to the point where I started seeing videos on TikTok, on Facebook, on and like everywhere that started to come up, and it was basically. Mi'kmaq indigenous fishermen being harassed on their boats by non-indigenous commercial fishermen. And what they would do is they'd when you run say their boats. Non-indigenous, with, are you being like PC for like white try, guys? Yeah, basically white. These are like okay. white fishermen, basically. Okay. Um, yeah. uh, so I'm trying to yeah. have to be that PC. <laughs> 
I have to be. I, it's today's world. You have, yeah, you, you know, Canadian. I got to be nice. <laughs> <laughs> but so, so that, so that kind of went back and forth. And but it got, it, it's getting dangerous now, right? Where you're, you're getting your boats up close. What they were doing, they were the, the. The, the white fishermen were basically bringing up the traps. <laughs> they were cutting the lines, destroying the buoys, destroying all the equipment. Um, they would run their, like there were videos where they would run their boats through the line, like, and have a hook through the line and just snap it, you know, just on purpose. And, you know, they weren't allowed to do it. It was illegal to do it, but they weren't getting arrested for doing it. Then they would come on shore. And, you know, once the, the, the indigenous fishers that were able to, bring back lobster they'd have their own lobster house and it got to a point a couple two weeks ago two and a half weeks ago there were two men two indigenous fishers in this lobster house that were surrounded by these you know quote-unquote protesters and they started vandalizing the lobster house they set the the guy's car on fire the van on fire and they they just threw stuff like through the windows I mean, the guys must have been petrified. They didn't leave that. They they felt they said if they left the house, if they left the lobster house, they would have been hurt. Like they would have been beaten up because there there well, seemed yeah, to be no cops. Like right, and there you have the royal mounted the royal Canadian mounted police. So it's not even just like right, local police. riding in on moose with their red jackets <laughs> on. And- <laughs> but I, yeah, no, they don't have. That's not that kind of. That's their. That's just their <laughs> ceremonial stuff. Come on now. Oh, come okay. on now. <laughs> I'm sure there's some over there. Anyway, um, but these are like like federal police, right? Like they're not just your your regular police. And and so um, there were you know there were protesters during the day, and what they would do is they would block trucks from going in and out to get the lobster to go to the market. Um, they would take uh, pieces of wood with nails in them, and they'd throw them under the trucks. The nails would get right. into the thing. And RCMP are just standing there and they're trying to keep the peace between the two groups. So there's, there's indigenous people there. There are, there are non-indigenous and they're, they're just hurling insults. And I mean, racist insults back and forth, Um, you know, and all these people are trying to do is just fish. It's they're, they're given right to fish and they're not allowed to fish. Then it got a couple of weeks ago, right after two days, two or three days after that vandalism, that same lobster house was set on fire at night. Right. And, and thank God nobody was in it and nobody, nobody got hurt, but it got to a point where it's like, this is, this is getting, this is getting ridiculous. Like people are going to, are going to, are going to die is what's going to happen. And it's just a matter of time. And so there have been a lot of protests. Sorry, go ahead. No, it's, it's, it's so strange to me because you see this everywhere in the world when if you give like a lot of people, the way their mentality works is if I give you some rights Mm-hmm. that are new to you that I don't currently have, somehow it's taking something away from me. Right. Like it, it's, and that's just not the thing. No. <laughs> you no. know, it's, it's, it's somehow if you help somebody else, yeah. but you're not helping that other guy over there, you're taking away from that something from the other guy over there. And it's crazy. I thought just Americans acted that way. Cause you no. see this in the Pacific Northwest all the time with salmon fishing. Yeah. Exactly. The yeah. Scenario. On both sides of the border. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's insane out there. And and you know, and a lot of people I know who fish out there are also very—I don't want to use the word racist, but maybe unintentionally racist towards well, indigenous people. They don't. Yeah. If you ask them, they will tell you they're not. You know, they're yeah. Go with everybody. Yeah. But yeah, there's the stuff they say. <laughs> it sure feels like racism to me. You know? Well, and I, and I think uh, you know when we when everything was going on down south this summer with the whole you know, with, with the BLM movement that's still happening and stuff. I didn't even hear about that. What are you about? <laughs> well, Canada kind of looked like everybody looked at Canada. was like, Oh, Canada's great. But then we looked in, in like to ourselves and we're just like, well, hold on a second. We're the exact same. Um, it just, it it's may nicer. not be as outward to, uh, to African Canadian community. Uh, but it's definitely to the native, to the indigenous communities. We are outwardly, not only from an individual basis, but from a government basis. I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's ridiculous because just a couple of years ago when you had indigenous people on the West coast, uh, it, like in Al, like not only BC, but Alberta and everywhere, uh, you know, protests for a pipeline to go through their land that they didn't want going through their land because they may not have had treaty agreements, but it's still their land. Uh, they would have CSIS, which is our spy agency, having, you know, 
files on them and following them around everywhere they went because they were protesting and they were leading protests against, against a pipeline. You know, right. So now when the roles are reversed and you're seeing violence happen against indigenous fishers that have the right, legal right, and the government has come out, Trudeau and himself, the prime minister of Canada has come out and said, these guys have the right to, to fish, it is, that you should let them fish. But the RCMP is still not going, like they're arresting people, but they're not mm-hmm. providing the support that the indigenous people need. No sign of Coast Guard on the water. The videos that are still going on every day where every time they go out, they get harassed by fishers and right. the, the hypocrisy. Well, people don't, yeah. It, well, and, and you think about it, like if, if the government or police or whatever you want to call them are not protecting purposely, not in protecting a certain race or class of people that smacks as racism. Yeah. <laughs> like it's right there. It's, it is. It, it, and in like, this situation, you know, when you have the RCMP that's, that's not helping out in terms of, of calming things down, they probably have their orders. Whatever those orders are, I don't know. I'm not there. I, I, I don't know anybody there in that system. But it's not help those guys eat lobster. Right. It's, it's not. Yeah. It's just like, let's just, let's just try. I, like, you see some of them just try and keep the peace. I mean, I did see one guy, you know, the video starts off as this guy, you know, this fisher put, uh, hands on an indigenous woman and a woman RCMP officer had this, this guy in, in uh, you know, like basically moving him back physically. And then this other guy grabbed the woman officer. And then you just see this massive RCMP officer come out and know the guy and be like, you don't touch the officer. And you're almost like, they should almost take the same stance as if you're touching, you know, you're, you're physically harming a woman just a woman in general, but a woman indigenous person for, you know, not listening to the thing. And so it becomes like a really difficult subject matter um, and complex. And it just, and it highlights, you know, the fisheries problem, you know, in Canada that we always see, but it also highlights the, the lack of a relationship between the federal government and, and the indigenous people, right? It, it really comes out in this that we've seen for years and decades, but just nothing's been done. It doesn't seem like, even though the government is supporting from Ottawa, they're saying, yeah, no, this, this person has the right. The fisheries and oceans minister hasn't come out to have people come to the table. The, the union leader for the non-indigenous fisher, uh, fisheries union resigned because his, an old, the fact, like a, a small faction within the union was threatening his life for not doing anything. Like, this is how yeah, bad it's getting. God, it's hard. It's, it's, I, I'll tell you what's refreshing is the, on the upside. I, it's Canada. Like, <laughs> how, how happy am I that Canada is not perfect today? We're not, man. It's true. <laughs> Everybody thinks we are. We're not. We have our problems. We have our systematic it's, it's racism. It's only a comparison to the craziness yeah. down here. So. Yeah. I mean, we like... Yeah, I'm not going to go into it because I don't want to cause a, a, a political disaster on this, on this We're podcast. Only from but election day, the, fi- the fishers are not going to change the outcome of the election. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> you never know. Who knows if it comes oh, I, I down am, to I one vote. Sure. You never know. <laughs> oh, no, we don't have one but, vote. We I mean, have electoral college. We don't <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah. But I mean, you know, like it, 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 it also like there's, there's also a, a good point that a lot of people are making is when was the last time an indigenous group was responsible for overfishing. You know what I mean? And, and yeah. you know, when, so when you have these fishers being able to, to fish all year long, and so, the, so the, the non-indigenous fishers came out and said, well, it's a conservation issue. We're supposed to go by seasons. So we need to go by seasons. So there was a great article in Hakai Magazine, which is out of BC, that interviewed four experts in fisheries, lobster fisheries, some people from Maine, some people are social scientists. Bob Stenner, who is a, a legend in lobster fishery and knows everything about lobster fishery. Basically, he said the same thing as I said earlier, which is I got it from him, was 500 traps are not going to affect the 900,000 traps that are out there. It's not going to make a difference. What you're seeing is just jealousy, basically. Yeah. Some basic form of, hey, they're doing it. I want it too. Yeah. Forgetting about how many years have, they, have those people been, uh, I said those people, which sounds... Terrible, but how how many years have that has that 
I don't, I don't, have, I don't have the language the Mick, skills. The Micmac, Micmac Indigenous the, Group, yeah. The, the, yeah, Indigenous people. I, I can't navigate this world. So, <laughs> but how many years have, have those uh, folks been, uh, been oppressed? Right. Let them catch a few freaking lobsters, right? But here's the question, right? If it wasn't lobsters, if it was whales, would you be on Team Micmac? Yeah, I would because we do, I'm we not. allow Inuvialuit people in, in the Arctic to hunt beluga whales and hunt bowhead whales, but they do it sustainably, right? I'm not, I'm not on that team. You're not on that team. And that's fine. I'm like, just stop. I'm like, just stop it. I, in fact, I lost, we lost listeners. I, um, uh, I guess. Gosh, a, couple of year, a couple of years ago, I did a story on Japan's whale hunting. And mm. we lost listeners because I said, I don't care what your culture is. It's mm. 2018. Stop killing whales. Right. I don't care. I think culture is a terrible reason to do things forever. That's why we had slavery. That's why we had a whole bunch of other things that are terrible in our history because we've always done it. All, always doing a thing isn't a reason to keep doing it. Stop killing whales. And I said that something like that. And I, we had listeners and they, they even, um, Report us for saying hateful things about the Japanese people. Hmm. Interesting. And I, I have nothing. I, I love Japanese people, and I always wanted to go to Japan. Yeah, I mean, they're a very interesting <laughs> culture. But, it, but, but I'm not supportive of whale hunting anywhere by anybody. I'm not there. Well, and I, I think it was. I mean, with the with the whole J- Japan whaling situation, it's they said it was for research, which we all know was bogus. You know, it was for right. food, and and I think that's where the hypocrisy came. Now them leaving the. Uh, the IWC and fishing on their own, like hunt, uh, you know, whale hunting on their own in their own area, um, mm-hmm. has kind of curtailed that. At least they're not, you know, fishing in the high seas. They're fishing within their own exclusive economic zone. It's not great. Uh, it's not perfect what we want, but at least the hypocrisy is done. You know, they're not right. saying we're doing it for research. We're they're doing it for food, and whether the people well, eat honest, it or not is another thing. Right. Well, then you have the same problem in the Pacific Northwest. There, there are some native cultures out there who hunt killer whales every year as part of their culture, and it's a big deal, mm-hmm. and they're very proud of it, and I'm not okay with it. Like, I just can't get there. I like, get it. Like, well, yeah, and to there. be honest, there's I, another I issue. I almost everything, but it's not that. So. Well, then there's another issue right now with, with seals and sea lions that I just covered on Monday's podcast where they want to kill half of the seals and sea lions on the West Coast because they think that they're affecting the recovery of fish populations. Yeah, which uh, it's here now too. Yeah, and, that, and that's been going. I mean, we know Candace had the, the seal call for, for quite a number of years, which has been very controversial. And on the West Coast, they don't want to start it because not only the controversy, but it just, you know, we just don't know the effects they want. They're not calling like in, in, I think in the U S they allowed for like a thousand sea lions to be called in the, in the Pacific Northwest recently, or like just a couple thousand, which, I mean, that's still a lot. This one, they want 75,000, 25,000 <laughs> stellar sea lions and 50,000 Harbor field. That, that's half their population. And then 3000 to maintain that. That's a lot. It's a lot, and and then they, and then of course, like it's 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 indigenous driven, so they want they've actually started talking to the Chinese government about trading fur pelts, and and so they're so saying they, this do is they a, eat the meat or is it just the pelts? So they would, I think they would sell the pelts, export the pelts to the to the Chinese government. I don't know if they would eat. I don't, I don't think they could eat that much uh, seal meat. Uh, in time or make seal products. But First Nations have been known to use every part of the body. I, I heard a story the other day where um, a documentarian was out with an Inuvialuit hunter and he was hunting a seal and he was taking apart everything. He said it was, was kind of gory, but he was taking apart the insides and he would put out some parts over to the left and some parts over to the right and so forth. And the guy's like, what are you doing? Why don't you just leave it all there? He goes, nope, that's for the seabirds. That's for the Arctic wolves. That's for the polar bears. And he's like, we put it out, we spread it out so that they can all Come have their on, own Come on, putting take. guts in the woods, that's... <laughs> no, this is just on, on ice. This that's is not... just on ice. Like, it's on open ice, right? But that's what they're saying. Yeah. And I mean, you know, like, I don't know anything about what that is, but these guys are very in tune with what the environment that's around sure. them. And, and so I see from a, certain, from a certain perspective, I see it. 
uh, you know, would I do it? No, because it's, that's not my, that's not my it's, thing. It's, I, it's I, funny. I'm, I'm okay. I'm okay with like the indigenous people doing some seal eating and seal hunting and that sort of thing. It's whales specifically that I'm like, you just in love with I whales. Come around. I can't come around on them. Yeah. I just can't. Yeah. So I'm not gonna. <laughs> yeah. Hey, you know, hey, hey I mean, to each, I'm pretty open-minded, you know, yeah. but, but I mean, like, I think there's a difference in, in disagreeing with what they, with what they do and then going out and calling them names and, and burning down their houses and, and doing that, there's which is what difference. the Nova Scotia yeah. fishermen, right? There's a huge difference imagine, in that. There's a, can you imagine if everyone you disagree with, you burn their house down? Yeah. It, it just doesn't make yeah. sense, but then you get away with it's, it. That's the thing is they're getting away with it. That's the, that's the, what pisses me off the most is that they're actually getting like they're actually being able to do it they're actually being able to throw around all this hate and they're not getting arrested or they're not getting dispersed uh yet if that was if the roles were reversed which they were reversed just this past weekend in ontario there was a a, a mohawk group that said they wanted their land back it got violent with opp which is our ontario provincial police uh and there was all group. around the news yeah. And, uh, and, and, but like everybody hated those, that, that first nation group because of it. And then, so it's like, if the roles are reversed, it's okay to hate that group. But when it's, when it's, you know, the white man, you know, hating on, on, on an indigenous group, they can get away with it. Yeah. I always say like, it's okay to hate what someone's doing, but be careful who you hate yeah. like, and how you treat are, it. But hating the action is okay. You know, it's, it's, yeah. it's a weird thing. Yeah. All right. I got a palate cleanser here. All right. Us. Good. Good. All right. Uh, here's the headline. So it's the only story I'm going to do tonight because we're running out of time. Uh, here's the headline. Escaped cloned female mutant crayfish take over Belgian cemetery. This is from New Zealand. <laughs> I love it. It's a great headline. And uh, so, so a bunch of uh, self-cloning mutant crayfish have escaped. They were created in experimental breeding programs and they invaded a Belgian cemetery. It, it is, so this is, this is true. There are these crustaceans that are man-made. They don't exist in nature at all. Okay. And they can dig up to a meter down and they're always female. There are no males in this species. Okay. But they're creating a big threat to biodiversity because they're all female, but they can clone themselves. Right. So each female can reproduce without ever having sexual reproduction, just making clones, popping them out one after the other. So you can't round them all up. And they've gotten into this graveyard uh, called Antwerp in New Zealand. And here's a quote from a scientist. Uh, it's impossible to round them all up. It's like, it's like trying to empty ocean with a thimble, says uh, Chemist Shears. He's from the Flemish Institute of Nature and Woodland Research. There's so many crayfish. They're called marble crayfish. And they travel across land and water at night, eat whatever they can, and they do not occur in nature and are banned by the European Union. So you can't, you're not supposed to have these in your homes or as pets. And instead, freshwater beasts, which are about 10 centimeters long, sort of big. They're big. It is big, yeah. I'm American, I know that's big. Um, <laughs> and they're voracious. And they're thought to have been bred by German pet traders in the 1990s. Yeah. And they're similar to the, to the slough uh, crayfish found in Florida, but are parthenogenic, which means they reproduce with themselves and all their children are just clones and they're all females. And they're so all genetically identical. Like, yeah. Like, so there's all, no diversity whatsoever. No. And, and I, I think in the long term, there's, there, by the way, that's, that's the whole story. But they're, <laughs> I just don't imagine all these <laughs> crayfish running across a field in New Zealand. Uh, they call them yabbies. Don't they call them yabbies? I think there? so. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, couldn't they eat them? What's well, I mean, you can make everything? a you can make a case for it. I mean, you know, crawfish in in New Orleans is in, in Louisiana is a is a huge delicacy, and sure. ten centimeters is no joke. I don't know if they. I find with crayfish, the bigger they are, the 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 worse they taste. Right? Like we have crayfish yeah, up here that are great. big. Yeah, and they're good bait too. So ah, good bait. Fisher I mean, people would love them. Yeah, but yeah, marbled crayfish. There must be some recipe they can write, and some play on words about them all being females. Like the princess marble crayfish souffle or something, and well, I find it real. Do you ever find it interesting when you hear about a, a you know, an animal like this that that's invasive or I mean, this isn't even considered invasive because it almost seems like it's lab made. But anytime no, we but have an invasive, stuff. yeah, every time we have like an invasive or introduced species, we can't get rid of it. 
But the natural species, the species that belong there, we can get rid of it within a couple of generations. Right. We're so good at it. Yeah. So how can we not be good at getting rid of these things? Like it is, it, it boggles my mind that we can't figure out, like put it back in the pet trade. You know, I just think it's just humans are just so stupid when it comes to these things. I think it comes down to capitalism. If you can't make money from it, it will never go extinct. So yeah. if it's not profitable to kill it, it won't get killed. That's true. You know, you got to develop I, I a market a, for it. Yeah, here's the real trick. I think, and I, I think this about most exotic foods that you're not supposed to eat. If you look at the history of most exotic foods, especially actually not in most cultures, something in the culture, if you dig deep enough, it's all about making wieners work better. <laughs> so it's all about dudes having stronger penises. And I think, so here's how you do it. You have to tell them that eating these marbled crayfish yes. <laughs> will make your, you know, your wiener four inches longer and you will smell great to women. They will sell tons of them. That's it, that's the only solution. <laughs> I'm in. I'm in. Let's do yeah, it. Any, any any weird food, that's pretty much why people eat it. And then you tell people you can't have it, and then they want it more. So you yeah, get sorry, you create the demand. We'd let you have it, yeah. but you're not from New Zealand. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Unreal. Great story. I love that story. Yeah. That's the one I want to bring in you because we've, we've eaten up a whole Yeah, I'm sorry. I, you know when I bring stories, I just go on and on and on. Yeah, but we have to get on because – let me end the news here. Hang on. We're going to bring on Doc Martin in a minute. Before that, though, I nice. want to make sure I thank our Patreon supporters. Uh, we have a couple of $25 patrons. Uh, Beth Metz, uh, if, by the way, if you uh, give us $25 a month, I'll mention your business. Beth Metz has no business, but I will tell you, if you say her name in the mirror 10 times in the middle of the night on full moon, she will visit you in your sleep and haunt you in your dreams. So that's Beth Metz. Thank you, Beth. And Josh Lopes at LopesTax.com. Give us $25 as well. And we thank you for that. And we have a brand new Patreon donor, Darren Radcliffe at $5 a month. Darren, thank you so much. You'll get a decal in the mail soon once I get more in the mail. You'll be entered into a monthly contest and you'll get some uh, fishy, um, fishy ringtones for your phone. It'll be a lot of fun. There you so go. You get that. But now, really important, we're going to jump into Doc Martin's uh, conversation with Dr. Richie. We're going to talk about Arapaima fish scales. She sent this to me, Andrew, almost a year ago. And really? Sitting on this interview. Yeah, because the interview is so good, but uh, Doc Martin's microphone was on the fritz and it sounds, she sounds terrible at it. Oh. <laughs> I, but I listened to it last night and I edited it like crazy. I took a lot of stuff out to try and clean the sound up. Uh, so I have a good, a good interview here for nice. you to listen to. Um, I will put the full unedited one up on Patreon. So if you subscribe on Patreon, you can listen to the whole thing. Nice, nice. Yeah. Yeah, but it's great if you want to learn about fish scales and how strong they are and why they're so strong. This is the interview for you. Let me just play a little intro music for you here. Happy music. I love this music. Well, Dr. Richie, welcome to the Fish Nerds Podcast. We are so excited to have you today. Thank you very much. Um, so just to get the fans introduced to who you are, why don't you tell us uh, who you are, where you're from, and what you're doing? Well, I'm not a fisherman, by the way, but um, I do study fish scales. I'm a professor at uh, University of California, Berkeley, in, in the Material Science Engineering Department and Mechanical Engineering Department. While I've been at Berkeley, I've been I, my area of research is is fracture. I break things. I break everything from airplanes to medical devices. And in the last 10, 15 years, I've been interested in um, biological materials as well. And that's what got me into looking at why fish scales are so effective as armor to fish. Excellent. And so that kind of asks, addresses my next question: Is what what really sparked um, your research, which uh, I found from perusing Science Daily, uh, one of the sites that I like to look at frequently, uh, they had an article and they titled it, What Gives a Three Meter Long Amazonian Fish Some of the Toughest Scales on Earth? Uh, that was based on your paper, which was published in the journal Matter, and that paper was titled, Arapaima Fish Scale, One of the Toughest Flexible Biological Materials. So, you, you break things, and eventually, throughout your research, you kind of discovered that 
fish scales are basically difficult to break. Is that pretty accurate? That's right. I mean, one of the interesting things about materials is we try to design, I'm into structural materials, so we try to design materials that you might make bridges and pressure vessels and airplanes and engines out of, which are effectively stronger, but they're also tougher. Now, those two words seem the same, but toughness means they're more resistant to fracture. And strength is basically how much load they can carry. So you want both those properties. And in general, those properties are mutually exclusive. Um, materials that are very hard and strong often aren't very tough and vice versa. Um, so and when we design new materials, new synthetic materials, we're continually dealing with that compromise. Well, it turns out that nature in its biological materials is very effective in doing this. Nature can design remarkable materials. It has a very limited palette of materials to play with. It makes its materials at basically room temperature, right? It's not like we can have, like we do, we have big furnaces and so forth. So nature does it in a very clever way. And so in the last maybe 15 years or so, a lot of people, including myself, have tried to look at how nature does things and find out what's the key. And, and, and if we can find out how nature does things, maybe we can make synthetic materials better um, by learning lessons from nature. And so that's what got me into this whole question of how, how do biological materials behave so well? And, and I've gone through a succession of materials. I started off looking at bone. I still look at bone, which has, of course, medical um, connotations and why for example, your bones get seem to get more brittle as you get older and so forth. Um, another one we looked at was, was a, a seashell, a mollusk shell, um, like the abalone shell, um, which is made of basically calcium carbonate, which is blackboard chalk, and a little bit of glue. And it has a toughness, resistance to fracture in energy terms, 3,000 times higher than what it's made of, this glue and, and the calcium carbonate. So nature's remarkable in this regard. And so the next iteration was to look at things like fish scales because they are really a very um, interesting form of lightweight armor. You know, with all these, uh, um, we, we have a lot of wars in the Far East these days. And so um, the average soldier has extremely heavy armor, these Kevlar plates that they wear are extremely heavy. So there's been a lot of interest of, can we make more effective yet lighter weight armor? And that was one of the rationales for looking at fish scales. When you talk about fish scales in particular, they are lightweight, but they also have that hardness, strength, and fracture toughness. And those are three properties um, that you mention specifically and individually uh, in your paper. And I was just wondering if you could kind of explain to myself and the fans what the differences are between those three terms and why those three are useful. Yeah, well, that's a, that's a good question. Um, I wrote a paper a few years ago called The Conflict Between Strength and Toughness because people often think these terms are the same. They're not. They're, not. they're quite different. There's actually three terms. Um, hardness and strength are the same thing. So the three terms are strength or hardness, Ductility is the second one, and the third one is the toughness or fracture toughness. Hardness is just how much load the part can carry or how much strength the part can carry or how difficult it is to penetrate this particular material. So um, we like hard materials, strong materials, because we don't have to use so much of them when we build a structure. We can make a, use less material to carry the load. Um, a lot of hard material, if you take a piece of silicon, um, or a piece of glass, that's quite hard, but if you bend it, it'll fracture immediately. So those materials are brittle. So the second pr property you want is called ductility. So if you take a paper clip, you can bend it, of course, and, it's, and it, it won't break. So it, 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 there's some deformability to it. So those are the two uh, most important properties, the, the strength or hardness and the ductility, and those two just completely opposite of each other. Things that are very ductile often aren't very hard. The combination of those two, strength and ductility, describes the toughness or the fracture toughness. And that's the resistance to fracture. And quite frankly, 
we that's the most important property in structural materials. You don't want you know the Golden Gate Bridge to suddenly break in two. You'd like it to bend a little bit first so you could see there was a problem. So in any um, structure, structure that we that we have, be it a, a pressure vessel around a nuclear reactor or an airplane or a, a turbine blade in a jet engine, we don't want materials to break catastrophically. We need that that high toughness. And so the design of these materials is, as I said, a, a game of trying to get high high strength, yet at the same time develop ductility and toughness. And and I think nature, as I said before, is remarkably adept at doing this. And so and nature does things very differently than, than the way we do it. The way that nature makes materials um, is quite different. And the whole basis of this biomimetic field or this uh, learning lessons from nature is to understand how nature generates these properties and maybe we can learn from that and adapt it into real materials the the issue with fish scales is particularly important because they are as you mentioned just now layered structures they have different properties on the outside compared to the inside and that's a trick that nature uses to combine these properties to get combinations of strength and and toughness and a fish scale is a very good example of that the arapaima is more of an ancient fish with a very with a very particular type of scale and the way that those layers are set up is what makes it exceptionally tough um would you want to expand on what makes this particular fish species scale the most interesting why not use um a minnow scale for example or you know your sunfish <laughs> Well, you know, there's lots of different fish you do it in different ways, but I think the arapaima is a very interesting one. As you know, this is a massive fish that populates um, the, the lakes of the Amazon um, in particular, and, and I think it's one of the largest freshwater fish out there. And, and um, these, these lakes that it lives in are infested with piranha, uh, which are extremely powerful, very sharp teeth and so forth. And yet the arapaima has existed for eons. And so it's obviously developed a means of defense against the arapaima. Um, it's, by the way, I wrote a paper on this years ago called uh, uh, on Nature's Arms Race, because it's just like you know our arms race with the former Soviet Union or like that. It's that, that um, certain the predator develops a stronger mean of attack, and therefore the the, the, the target, in this case, the arapaima fish, has to have some defense of this. So um, the scales of the arapaima fish are designed to effectively um, resist the bite of, a par of an arapaima, yeah, uh, sorry, of a, of a um, piranha, um, and other things as well, I suppose, if they're in those lakes. Um, the other thing is it needs to be flexible. I mean, if, the, if, if you had, if you imagine sort of armor plate around the fish, it wouldn't be very flexible. So um, fish scales generally are these have this combination of resistance to being penetrated by a bite of, of some predator um, and the notion of being still being flexible. The flexible one is kind of easy to explain. The fish scales are overlap. They basically are attached to the body of the fish at one end and they overlap the underlying scales. And this is typical of armor that things like the Romans use, for example, same sort of thing. Um, the, the overlapping scales give some flexibility. But the, from the perspective of the attack by the predator, and, and this is just like designing an armor to, to stop a bullet in, 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 uh, in, in synthetic armors, you need something really hard on the surface to resist the penetration of the bullet, or in the case of the fish scale, the tooth. So you need a really hard surface to resist that penetration, a very strong and so the thing, just so you can't penetrate it, you can obviously stick your finger into a piece of, of, of jelly, and that's, but yet you couldn't stick your finger through a piece of glass for the same reason. Um, so the hardness is really important in the outer layer. However, if the entire fish scale was like that, then it would simply shatter. If you took a bit of glass and you drove a nail into it, you know the whole pane of glass would probably shatter. So there's gotta be an underlying layer which can accommodate all this extra deformation and absorb the energy. And so the nature, the basis of an armor typically is a very hard outer layer 
and a softer yet tougher inner layer. So that's how we do it, and that's how nature does it. But nature's cleverer than us. We tend to um, take a material and then we then we bond a hard layer to the outside. So we have a hard and soft layer, a hard and tough layer uh, layers. But there's an interface between those two layers, and interfaces where the two layers join together are generally regions of potential weakness where cracks can form, the layers can debond, and this kind of thing. But nature does it a little different differently. It uses gradients. So if you look, you take a section through a fish scale, it's very hard on the outer surface and very tough on the inner surface. But those properties don't change dramatically at the interface. There's no interface. It's graded down. Nature develops this gradient. So if you follow the hardness, it goes from being very, very hard and then slightly less hard, slightly less hard till it gets to the inner layer. When you look at the toughness, it has the opposite gradient. And those gradients are really what makes um, the layers even not um, delaminate or, or spall off. So the notion of gradients um, is a very, very important aspect of, of nature's materials. We all know that they have many, they have a hierarchical structure. You've probably seen these pictures of bone from very large scales in the millimeters to meters, all the way down to atomic scales. And this structure in each one of those layers, that's something that nature does very well. But the gradients are the other thing. It can grade the properties. If you look at a piece of bamboo, it is very stiff, um, yet flexible. It's hard. You, it's, you can't cut it very readily, but it's very flexible. Those are properties which often don't go in tandem, but, it's, but bamboo is like that because the the structure of bamboo at the micron, micron scale varies as you go from the inside to the outside. It gets progressively coarser um, as you go inwards. And so this, this enables bamboo to have these combinations of properties. Exactly the same with the fish scale. Same with your teeth. Your tooth has a very hard enamel layer on the outside, which is important because the hardness prevents wear and this kind of, and, and um, bites on something too hard yet if the whole tooth was made of enamel it would shatter so the inner part of the tooth is made of something called dentin and there's a again a gradient of, of, of properties from that inner tougher region to the outer harder region and that's exactly how a fish scale basically works and that's why it's so effective this is the this is the bulagan structure which it's sometimes called the twisted plywood structure i don't know if you ever remember um, Liberace, the, the, um, the, the artist who played the piano, he would walk down a spiral staircase when he. But that's exactly what the bulligan structure looks like. So, so instead of having the fibers, this is the collagen now, arranged in one direction or maybe a cross ply in two directions, they are arranged in this spiral staircase sort of thing. That each layer of collagen is is a little bit of an angle twisted from another one, and then another one, another one. And so you have this sort of beautiful um, helical arrangement of, of the collagen. This is called the bulagan structure. We, um, and it, it has some very interesting properties. But in the fish scale, it's a much more, that, that subsurface layer is much more ductile. And the bulagan structure works there in a, in a slightly different fashion. Um, what it does is that as you stress that region, the fibers can rotate. It's like a smart structure. The fibers, these collagen fibers can rotate and they rotate primarily into positions which can carry more load. So they're effective in sustaining the excess deformation and lows, load caused by some um, predator fish trying to, to, um, to bite through the scale. So this Bulagan structure is a, is a very interesting way of toughening the material and, and as i said nature uses that beautifully um, we love to use that by the way in, in synthetic materials but kind of difficult to make <laughs> that's the different that's the problem if you take a piece of these materials and and break them in a testing machine you can as and, and we we then watch a crack growing in it that's a very extreme case you can see these layers rotating and opening and each successive layer carries more and more load and then as it rotates we call it um 
adaptive structural reorientation, but it's a very effective way of basically absorbing energy so that that energy can't be used to propagate a crack. If that is happening, to, depending on a degree of how much stress you're putting on the part due to the predator attack um, in real time in these situations. I mean, the way that armor was generated um, over the last 20 or 30 years, and, and it's, uh, it's like the development of polymer composites that we use now for airframes in the Boeing 787 and that we use in tennis rackets and skateboards. I mean, when you look at how these things are designed and the way that nature designs them, it's not that different. I mean, I don't think tennis rackets were nature inspired, but, but man came to the same conclusion as, as nature did. But nature develops these really complicated ones. And the Bulagan structure is a classic one. There's a, another fish we looked at. I don't know if you've ever heard of the silicon fish. Um, this was the, a fish that was found in 1938 off the coast of Madagascar. And it was thought to have been extinct for about 50 million years. Um, and of course, it isn't extinct. It's a, it's a, uh, there's another one similar to it called the Australian lungfish. And this is, these are basically living fossils. We've looked at those scales as well, and they have a double boulagan structure. They have two spiral staircases intertwined, it, you know, which are orthogonal to each other, which is even tougher than the one for the, well, some respects more resistant to damage than the arapaima, but far less flexible. So um, now the question is, how do you make those? How do you make those in a synthetic material? How do you make the gradients that I've just talked about? The way we make materials is we basically take a big chunk of metal and then we beat it down and we roll it and, and all this kind of thing. So that's called top down. We start from a big piece and try to get down to a small piece. Nature has the other approach. It does it bottom up. It starts with molecules and atoms and builds these things up from the bottom. And by doing that, it can generate these gradients in composition or gradients in structure, size, or shape, or it can, it can develop these complicated hooligan type structures because it's building it up from the bottom. So the, the use of bio-inspired structural materials has been a little bit limited to date because we just have difficulty making those things with conventional processing techniques. But there is a light, light at the end of the tunnel, and that's this, you've probably heard about 3D printing. Now, 3D printing potentially is a means of doing this because you can do bottom-up type processing. You can start with little things and you can build up complicated structures. And so the, I think the development of truly bio-inspired structural materials will blossom with the advent of 3D printing. However, there's a problem with 3D printing now. Um, you read a lot of hype about this. People talk about they're gonna 3D print turbine blades and make houses and automobiles. And it's pretty scary because what you can't do with 3D printing now, you can make the shape, but you can't always make the quality of the material. And so, if you make, you, it's great for making a prototype. It's great for making a doorknob, but no one in their right mind would make a turbine blade, which if it broke, would cause a catastrophe out of a 3D printed material because of this difficulty of controlling the microstructure, controlling the structure, which of course the properties depend on. So I, I my personal feeling about 3D printing is it's totally overhyped. It's cheaper, it's potentially fantastic, um, it's, it's, the, it's the key, I think, to developing truly bio-inspired structural material. Well, I mean, I think the things you talk about are, 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 are important details, but there's still details. The, the bigger picture, I think, is what we've just talked about. Um, there are a myriad of, of course, biological materials that can be looked at. And so we've still got a lot to learn about how nature does things and, and looking at different structures and and trying to see parallels. I mean, how does the crocodile scale prevent penetration versus you know, the arapaima fish? Is, is, are there any common motifs? So that's, that's gonna um, sort of interest people like myself uh, for decades to come. But the real 
the real issue is that it's just it's an academic playground unless you can harness that information to make new materials to make better materials and and i think now we're learning a lot more about how nature does things and there's still a lot more to learn of they said because there's lots of different natural materials but the real issue is how do we make these things can we make them economically can we make them in big scale can we make them with all these complexities that nature has i think that is that's the real battle it, it's 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 um, the problem of what we call processing how, how, and how do you manufacture these materials um and i think that is still up in the air we, we know potentially how we can do it um but as I said, it, that process it takes a long time with structural materials. You, we all are used to electronic materials. Somebody invents a new chip and it finds itself into an iPhone or a, a laptop within six months. That is just totally opposite to the way that structural materials are generated. Someone develops a structural material, be it designed on based of nature or something else, and, and it takes 30 or 40 years to find itself into a really cutting edge application like an airplane or an engine. In the meantime, by the way, though it might change the game of tennis and the tennis rackets or make better skateboards, but there's a much longer fuse. And I think that's gonna be really needed if we're truly going to enhance um, the, our ability to make these complicated materials. You know, there's an interesting sort of philosophical issue now in with metals, I, I study something called high entropy alloys, which are materials that have many, many elements in. Most of our metallic alloys only have one element that's dominant, like iron in steel, and nickel in super alloys. These have many, many elements. And these can, you can generate really phenomenal properties out of this. But with all these elements in, they're very expensive. The other approach is to use a natural approach, which is to take a single element and then design in the properties the way that nature does with these complicated structures, these gradients, these adaptive structures that move. And so that potentially is a, a, a cheaper way of doing things and putting lots of different elements in. But how do you make those materials? We can make them in little tiny little, you know, in the nano scale or micro scale, but how do you make an entire turbine blade out of that? That is, in fact, the challenge. So I think eventually we'll see more nature-inspired structural materials. You know, in armor, like the fish scale, or in in, um, in turbine blades, like seashells, for their high toughness. But it's going to take a while, and it's going to take a while to develop those materials because it always does for structural materials. But we have this problem of how to make them. I think that's. That's the battleground. That's that's where people will need to put their energy if this becomes, you know, a reality in, in, in the in the bigger form. There's one other thing that could happen. Some people are looking at the notion of using nature to make materials, not not just to mimic their properties, but to grow materials, you know, cell farms or something like this. So that's another thing that could happen. But again, the the use of these materials in engineering structures is a long way off, quite frankly. All right, well, um, Dr. Ritchie, thank you so much for taking time out of your very busy morning to talk about fish scales and biomaterials with the Fish Nerds podcast. I really appreciate it. It's really my pleasure, thank you. All right, well, I look forward to uh, reading more of your research as it comes out, and is there any uh, anywhere that you want fans to go if they're interested in your research, any websites you can share? Well, if I mean, I, I mean, I've I've written quite a lot of papers on biological materials. If anyone's interested, you can go to my website, which is um, www.lbl.gov. Uh, it's Lawrence Birdie Lawrence.gov backslash Richie R I T C H I E, and you'll see all those publications under the publications. Uh, a banner on my website if anybody's interested great we'll make sure that we uh put that uh, website up when we post the podcast okay thank you very much all right thank you so much all right whoops <laughs> all right well thanks doc and, <laughs> and dr richie thank you for that what did you think of the interview andrew did you enjoy that? i love it you know what's funny is 
I, I've only met Doc on Facebook. I've yeah. never met her through podcasting. I have to have her on my podcast because she's so Doc interesting. Martin, she's wonderful. She's yeah. Gorgeous. Yeah. And I want to have her on so badly. I just never get around to doing it. There's always, I, you know, that's me in a nutshell is I always want to do stuff. It's just never enough time in the day. We're all there. She'll come on. Absolutely. She's, she's great. Yeah. Her ego might get in the way though. Recently she, we have, we have a, <laughs> a new song coming out. She's also a musician and she's written us a new song and on next week's show, we're going to debut Ooh, her new I song. I can't wait. I can't wait. Yeah. But all I'm going to say is a uh, WAP. Definitely oh no. A hint, <laughs> a hint to her new song. So something to look forward to. I've already heard it, but I won't give out too much. Lies. Lies. Yeah. I love right, it. So we need to wrap up this show because that's it. You've listened to a bunch of fish nerds when you should have been fishing. Special thanks to Andrew Lewin from Speak Up for the Ocean Blue podcast. Big thanks to Doc Martin uh, for her sciencing work. And thank you to Wally Pleasant and Diane's Bath Salts for the music in this week's show. And until next time, follow the code of the fish nerds. Spawn early and often. Never trust a free lunch with string attached and swim against the current every chance you get. That's it, Andrew. You made a Fish Nerds podcast. Love it. Thank you. Music, yeah. Thanks for coming on tonight. You bet, man. Thanks Thanks for having me. In a stream, getting those ankles wet. Or deep in the ocean, casting nets. Fish Nerds. Fish Nerds. Fish Nerds. It's a podcast. Just for the hell of it. Fry it in a basket or broiled in a pan. Eat it raw like you're in Siam. Fish nerds. Fish nerds. Fish nerds. It's a podcast. It's a podcast. It's a podcast. (laughs) I love that song. That song is the best song. We're going to end the Facebook part here. All right, good.